The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. The risen Christ is with us. Praise the Lord. Welcome to First United Methodist Church. I, uh, you know, uh, I'm a little frazzled. I've been running around frazzled all morning long. Got up here um, for the 8.30 service. We didn't have any internet. And, and, uh, and if we don't have internet, I can't print. And I had put off printing my sermon notes um, until this morning. And, uh, it, it, and so I, I thought, and, and really the truth of the matter is, the sermon notes are more for you guys than they are for me. Because if I don't have those notes, there's no telling how long I'll ramble. Um, so, uh, but, but uh, one of the reasons I didn't, I didn't print them off, uh, it's, it's, it's been, a, the last couple of days have been kind of frazzled, so, so I'm, starting to, I'm starting to feel right, in, right at home there with, with being frazzled somewhat. We went to, uh, we, some of you know, we've got a little cabin out in the middle of nowhere. And, uh, and, and we went there the last couple of days. We were there Friday and, and, and Saturday. And uh, I, that's where I was working on my, my sermon. Actually, we went Thursday night. So I, early Friday morning, I'm, I'm working on my sermon, sitting on that back porch. Just beautiful. It was kind of cool. It's, it, it, it's out in the hill country like that. It's amazing. Uh, it's, it's not like a sauna. And, and so we, we were... We were enjoying that for a moment, sitting on the back porch, or I was, sitting on the back porch, working on my sermon. Cindy was talking to our daughter on the, on the phone. She had to walk up a hill, because there's, <laughs> so she was up on a hill on the cell phone talking to our daughter, and uh, the, 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 the doors to the cabin were, it's a little one-room cabin, doors were open so that the breeze would go through. It was so nice, and I'm working, typing away, got my laptop there, working along, and all of a sudden, I hear Cindy just screaming bloody murder. I thought something, she, she comes through the house, and, and, and uh, she says, there was a snake. It was this big in the kitchen part of the, uh, this big, and, and I, I went in there. I never saw the snake. I went in. <laughs> But I'm sure the way she was screaming, that she scared that snake half to death, and it was gone pretty quick. But she, so we pretty much took everything. I, I, I dismantled the kitchen counter and everything. To, to, we never did find the snake. So, um, but to my wife's credit, God bless her. There she is back there. We stayed. We spent the night anyway, and, and, and she, was, she was perfectly fine with it. She is a trooper. And uh, so anyway, it's, it's been a little, uh, we got our internet back going, so welcome to those of you that are joining us online. Um, and so anyway, I'm just so happy to have the opportunity to step back, calm down, and be in worship with all of you. So with that, uh, you know what? I, 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 see, this is the frazzled level. I want to make a couple of quick announcements. I want to make sure... Um, one of, the, one of the things, see I've written them here in my 8.30 service bulletin. Um, Amanda Banda, the Reverend Amanda Banda, will be joining us on July 11th. That will be her first Sunday. Uh, so I want to make sure everybody knows, on July 11th, Amanda Banda will be here. We're going to have one service to welcome her and the Banda family. She's going to be preaching. Um, it's at 1040 in here in the sanctuary. We will be live streaming the service into the contemporary worship space uh, in case it gets a little crowded in here. If there's anybody that feels uncomfortable being in that much of a, a crowd, so we'll have it live streamed in there. Uh, and then United Methodist men are going to be cooking and, and uh, we're going to have a luncheon together uh, to help welcome the Banda family uh, on July 11th. So one service, 1040, and then a luncheon afterwards. Um, also, uh, coffee with Pastor Wade. Uh, really, I, I'm going to start doing this about once a month um, in the evenings. Uh, this, this next one, or the first one, is Monday, July 19th at 5.30 p.m. And this is really designed. I know we've had a lot of people joining us online, some that have uh, joined our church, some that are considering joining, have just been visiting for a while. This is an opportunity for us to get together. I would like for uh, those that are um, 
you know, relatively new to First United Methodist Church for us to be able to get together and have coffee or lemonade or whatever, something uh, on, on uh, July 19th at 5.30 p.m. Uh, we'll meet up here at the church. I don't know exactly where. Just come to the church. We'll find you. You find us, and, and, and we'll get together uh, somewhere here at the church and just and visit a little bit, uh, help you understand and know uh, how uh, to be involved and, and how to engage at First United Methodist Church, or even help you make that decision uh, as to whether or not First United Methodist Church is where you would like to uh, continue to engage, and I hope that it is. So uh, with that, now I invite you to stand for our call to worship this morning. I think our key word there is get together. Yes. And uh, we're excited about doing that. And as we uh, bring ourselves to worship, let's listen carefully to these words together. We wait for the Lord. Our souls wait for the Lord. And I hope, hope in God's, God's word. word. Our souls wait for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. Let us seek hope in our God whose power is enduring love. We wait for the Lord and for our hope, God's presence. And I think, uh, Cindy, maybe this song is for you. Do you feel like you were touched by God when the snake left? So we're going to sing 367, and I'd love to hear your voices this morning. He touched me, 367. may be seated. <clears throat> Let us pray. Almighty an everlasting God, in whom we live and move and have our being, you created us for yourself so that our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. Grant to us such piety of heart and strength of purpose that no selfish passion may hinder us from knowing your will and no weakness from doing it. In your light, may we see life clearly, and in your service, find perfect freedom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. 
And I would invite you uh, now to our prayer of confession. One of the wonderful things about our faith is this grace that Christ offers us and this opportunity for forgiveness. So we go to God as a church, repenting and asking forgiveness, and we'll take a moment and offer our own personal silent uh, confession as well. Would you join me? We are reluctant, loving God, to set aside our hurt, our anger, our disappointment. Heal us with your tender touch that we might be cleansed of all unclean thoughts, all schemes of revenge, all hope of vindictive retribution. Open our eyes to the power of love shown to us in the unselfish sacrifice of your Son. Our, Our Savior, Savior, Jesus Christ. Christ. Amen. You're invited now to a time of personal silent confession. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. This proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Will you join me in the prayer for illumination, please? Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Our first reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 7 through 15. Now, as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in utmost eagerness, and in our love for you, so we want you to excel also in this generous undertaking. I do not say this as a command, but I am testing the genuineness of your love against the earnestness of others. For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. And in this matter, I am giving my advice. It is appropriate for you who began last year not only to do something, but even to desire to do something, now finish it, so that your eagerness may be matched by completing it according to your means. For if the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. I do not mean that there should be relief for others and pressure on you, but it is a question of fair balance between your present abundance and their need, so that their abundance may be for your need in order that there may be a fair balance. As it is written, the one who had much did not have too much, and the one who had little did not have too little. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand as you're able for our gospel reading this morning. It comes from Mark's gospel. Chapter 5, beginning with verse 21. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So he went with them. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for twelve years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had, and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak, for she said, If I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. 
Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say, Who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go and be, go in peace and be healed of your disease. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Now, as, uh, as we look really at, at uh, the, the reading earlier from 2 Corinthians, Corinthian church, the Corinthian church is such a cool case study in church life, I think. Uh, they've done some things very wrong, and they've done some things very well. Uh, they've struggled to find their way, but have sincerely wanted to follow God. Even though they managed to mess things up time and time again, they wanted to follow God. The Apostle Paul established the church in Corinth, and Paul's ministry um, was largely one that reached out to the Gentiles, uh, which is ironic you know, the Gentiles, the non-Jews, it's ironic because Paul um, had been a, a Jewish Pharisee uh, before he was a follower of Christ. Uh, in fact, Paul never even met Jesus when Jesus was here in earthly bodily form. Paul only came face to face with the dazzling light of Christ after Jesus had been crucified and ascended back into heaven. So Paul was going around persecuting Jesus' followers. Paul even supervised the stoning of one of the apostles, St. Stephen. Paul wasn't evil, though. Paul wasn't evil. Paul was what we would call zealous. He would do anything for God. As a Jewish Pharisee, Paul loved God so much and wanted to work hard for God and wanted to make a difference for God so much that he was willing to, cra to, to kill these, these crazy people running around talking about Jesus. Jesus, who Paul considered blasphemous. Paul couldn't stand somebody parading around telling people they were the son of God or, or, or that they were God. Nor could he stand, once that guy, Jesus, was dead, nor could he stand having his disciples, Jesus' disciples, running around trying to convince people of Jesus' uh, divinity either. That is, until one day, Jesus confronts Paul in a very spectacular way. I'm sure we'll talk about Paul's conversion, or you've talked about it in Sunday school, or read it on your own in Scripture. We'll get to that at some point. But for, for today, just know that all this zeal that Paul had toward per towards persecuting Christ followers, now he had just as much zeal for evangelizing the world. Now he had just as much zeal for honoring Jesus the Christ and recognizing that Jesus is God. Jesus want us, wants us working in his kingdom, and Jesus loves us so much that he's willing to correct us when we just don't get it. He loves Paul so much, uh, that, uh, and, and the world so much that and, and we talked about forgiveness earlier in our prayer of confession, but he, he, God took Paul, a persecutor of Christians, and made him one of the most pivotal figures in spreading Christianity to the Gentile world. So, Paul planted this church in Corinth much like he planted churches all throughout the Mediterranean world. Paul got them going, you know, got the church going, left them with some instructions, some core beliefs and understandings about the grace of Jesus Christ, and then he set out to plant more churches. Or he set out to go check on some of the other churches that he had previously planted elsewhere. And if we look at Paul's first letter 
to the Corinthians, we see that, that he's giving them a lot of grief over stuff that they're doing wrong. Paul is really hammering them in that first letter to the Corinthians. He loves them, but he's pretty disappointed in them. He sees that the church is divided. It seems that Greek philosophy may have started to have more of an influence in the church than grace did. There was this oligarchic system in the Greco-Roman world that didn't exactly lend itself to Christian teaching. The Corinthian church was stumbling, and Paul let them know about it. This is all happening in the mid-50s, not the leather jackets and sock 50s, but the original 50s, as in like 1954, or not 19, as in 54, 55 A.D. is when Paul is, is establishing these churches and writing to the, to the Corinthians. So in Corinthians, uh, so the Corinthians get Paul's first letter, they reflect on it, probably got a little mad about it, but when they truly looked at themselves, they made some changes. They made some progress. Now, we jump to Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. That's what we read from today. That's what Joy read from today is Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. And we can probably, we can tell by reading through and looking at 2 Corinthians that the, the church there was probably a little put out with Paul from the way he had written them previously and what he had said to them. They're, they're put out with Paul. And uh, after the rebukes that they got in 1 Corinthians, Paul then spends some time in 2 Corinthians assuring them that he loves them, assuring them that he does love them. He says it in his own way, you know. He says basically... You know, I've got a lot of churches that I serve, but y'all are my favorite. That's why I'm so hard on you, is, is, is kind of what he's, he's getting across. But he also knows, Paul also knows that in Corinth, some false teachers are popping up. Some false teachers are beginning to emerge, and they're beginning to question Paul's authority. So he spends a good bit of time in his second letter uh, trying to tell them why they should listen to him and not the other guys. But I think the thing that I admire here about Paul is that even though he knows that the Corinthians are a little bent out of shape about him, a little uh, perturbed with him, Paul encourages them in this second letter. Even when he may feel like pushing them a little harder or forcing them to listen and follow, he sees God at work and that God is moving them forward. Maybe not at the same pace that Paul would like to see, but he's moving them forward. And Paul recognizes that forcing someone to accept Jesus Christ as Savior is not really a victory. Only when someone willingly accepts Jesus Christ through encouragement and grace is that person able to truly have a relationship with Christ? How many couples have had this type of discussion? Why don't you ever clean the kitchen? Then a night or two later, you clean the kitchen and you say, I did it, I cleaned the kitchen. And the other one says, I don't want you to just clean the kitchen, I want you to want to clean the kitchen. <laughs> Now, why would I want to clean the kitchen? You know, that's the, uh, we have that. And, and, and the answer to that question is, I want to clean the kitchen because it's important to you. And I love you. So that's why I want to do it. Now, Cindy and I have this routine in the mornings, and it's, it's changed up some from time to time, but our routine for a long time has been some variation of get up early, have coffee together, and get ready for work. A couple of years ago, since um, I'm, I'm usually the one that starts getting ready first, a couple of years ago, I made the bed as I was waiting for the, the shower to get warm. And later that day, Cindy called me and told me how much she appreciated the bed being made. She said it made her day. 
how low must her expectations for me be <laughs> that that made her day? But I went with it. I went with it, and the next day I made it again, and again the next day, and been making the bed every day for about the last two years now. <laughs> and, the thing, yeah, and the thing is, it's not about making the bed. It's about wanting to do something that I know Cindy appreciates. I want to make the bed, not for the bed's sake, but for Cindy's sake. Earlier, if we had read a little bit uh, previous to what Joy read in, in uh, 2 Corinthians, we would have seen uh, Paul saying to the Corinthians, hey, look, the Macedonian church, they haven't been as fortunate as you guys in Corinth. The Macedonian church, they've fallen on some hard times. But even in the midst of their struggles, they found joy in their generosity. They gave as much as they were able to. No strike that, he says. They gave more than they've been able to. And they did so with glad hearts. Then he turns to the Corinthians in his letter and he says, now what about y'all? Y'all got a lot going on in Corinth. Y'all are top-notch when it comes to art and literature and wisdom. You're really growing in love. Let's make sure you continue to grow in generosity. He says, now I'm not saying that you have to give more. I'm not commanding you to give more. I mean, last year, y'all gave, he tells them. Last year, y'all gave. Y'all were the first to give, and you did so with glad hearts. Let's keep it going. Not because I said so, but because you want to. I think when we look at what Paul is telling the Corinthian church, he's asking them to look outside of themselves. If we read through 1 Corinthians, we see that's one of the things that he's really digging in on them about. Is there... Uh, propensity to, to look inside, to, to, to look at the church as something that serves them and them alone. How can I get more for me out of the church? But what he's doing here, as he's encouraging them in 2 Corinthians, we see that Paul is telling the Corinthian church to look outside of themselves. The purpose of the church is not for their own enjoyment. Yes, the church will be their strength when they need it. Yes, the church is something that will definitely build them up. Yes, the church is something that they will ultimately enjoy and love being a part of because they've managed to see the church as something other than a means to making only their lives better. They've managed to recognize that the church is something that the church enhances others' lives as well. And they can be a part of that. That there are people, many people, many people outside of their circle that need a relationship with Jesus Christ. And through the church, through them, they can make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Whether Paul is asking them to give of their finances to support the church, or whether I'm up here pleading for people, especially men, to volunteer at basic training camp for our children. Giving of ourselves, our time, our talent, our treasures. We want you to want to invest in the kingdom of God through First United Methodist Church. But that doesn't mean that we just want you to, to give of your money and your time and your talents and all that. We want to hear from you as well. There's a wealth of knowledge. There's a wealth of longing. There's a wealth of, of information and, 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 and God moving in the hearts of our people. Hearing from you also helps the church understand the community. Hearing from you because you are a part of the community, because you are a part of First United Methodist Church, 
You have the same struggles and celebrations as your neighbors. You have children going through difficult times, children celebrating milestones as well. You've lost jobs. You found new ones. You've grieved the loss of loved ones. You've celebrated births. You are Victoria, Texas. You are this community. Now last week, I introduced you to a, to a concept that we're calling thriving congregations. It's a, ver, a, a diverse, fairly diverse uh, uh, team of members from our church that have been wrestling with the question of what does it look like to thrive at First United Methodist Church? Part of that task that this uh, team has been trying to wrestle with, part of that task includes hearing from you, the congregation. We're embarking on this season of listening. So you'll notice in your bulletins that there are some little pages like this that have just a couple of very simple questions on them. We want to hear from you. Our thriving congregations team wants to hear from you. Now these questions are not very specific. They're supposed to be an intentionally very open-ended. You can answer those questions however you like. Your answer can be personal and individual, or it may be broader in the way you answer them. It's really up to you how you want to answer these questions. Don't just try to come up with something that you think the Thriving Congregations team wants to hear. Just simply answer these questions to the best of your ability. The first thing that you think of, jot that down. The first thing that it moves you to answer, jot that down. This isn't going to be the extent of our listening, but it's a place for us to start. I'm going to ask you to start thinking about it now. Hopefully you have a pen or something you can write with, um, but I ask you to start thinking about it now uh, and, and write down the answers. And, and there will be an extended time during our offering for you to to jot things down as well uh, during our offering. I visited with Keith earlier, and he's going he's gonna to make our offertory a little bit longer than normal so that you have some time to get, the, to get some information and convey these things uh, on this, this uh, uh, card here. And after the service, I would include you to just leave it uh, in your, just take it, leave it in, uh, in your seat there, and, and uh, someone will, will come immediately after the service and gather each of those up. Um, because that's, that's what I think Paul is asking this Corinthian church to be able to do, is to, to discern and determine what it means to thrive. He's giving them some, some, some thoughts about how they want to survive, but it, it really has to come from within that Corinthian church. They have to have that want to. And I know you all have that want to. So today I'm simply asking that you express a little bit of that want, a little bit of that longing on this sheet so that we may continue to grow in love to grow in generosity, and to reach out to the world to transform it in the name of Jesus Christ. God bless you. Our next hymn is uh, Great is Thy Faithfulness. It's found at number 140 in the hymnal. I invite you to stand as you're able as we sing.
Would you remain standing, please, as we affirm our faith? I believe in God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. As I listened to uh, Wade talk about us and where we're going, I just had this picture of how we've all been confined, and I, I, I could see this cocoon, a butterfly cocoon. And I thought, you know, we're just waiting to get out of that little cocoon where we've been confined so much and fly. So um, I hope that you think about this as we hear um, our offering this morning. And the offering plates are in the North X. If you have not had a chance to put it there, or you can donate online. And uh, there's a mobile app. And if some of you haven't learned how to do that yet, come to the church and say, somebody teach me, because it's, it's a really great way to get information. In addition to our financial offering, we want to offer up our prayers. And we want to share our joys and our concerns with each other. And if you would like to, you can text that to the number that's in the bulletin. I'll repeat it for you. It's 361-210-6720. And those will be included in our weekly prayer list. Uh, I noticed that there was one that was sent last week asking for prayers for Rich Wisniewski, who is, um, has been a member of this congregation but has moved on. And so if you would add that to the list on the back of your bulletin, Rich Wisniewski, and we'll listen to our offertory.
You may be seated. This is our prayer of thanksgiving as we include prayer concerns also. Lord Jesus, we lift to you the joys and concerns that have been offered today. The joys and concerns that have been texted as well as those that remain private. We pray for peace and comfort and healing and mercy and reconciliation and hope. Lord, as we look at our world, there is much that frightens us bad people in powerful places and wars and rumors of wars and pandemic and disease, nations raging against nations. We feel powerless to impact these terrifying forces. They make us feel small and vulnerable. And when we take stock of our own lives, we feel freer. We love our families, but many times our families go in directions that make us fearful. Our children grow up and leave. A beloved spouse is in the grip of addiction, and we don't know how to help them. We can't earn enough money to support our families in the way we would like. The company we work for doesn't seem to appreciate our work, and we feel out of control of our future. Lord, Help us not to be afraid of today or tomorrow. Still the storms that rage around us. Speak to us a word that gives us confidence in you and your work in the world. And calm our fears so that we may have renewed confidence to bring all things toward you. In your holy name. We pray joining our voices together as you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. If you haven't filled out your little form, please try to do that. These are questions that are kind of hard to answer sometimes, but make the effort because I think our group is trying to do the best they can to help us hear what we want to do and what we feel is we need to be as a thriving congregation. And our closing hymn is There is a Balm in Gilead, 375.
this morning. Some of us haven't seen each other for a while, so take a chance to visit with each other. And if there's somebody you see around, you think, I'm not sure who that person is, go up and say, I can't remember your name, but I'm so-and-so. That's what we gotta do to reach out to each other, to come out of that cocoon. So the blessing dismissal is this. Grant, O oh Lord, that what has been said with our lips, we may believe in our hearts, and that what we believe in our hearts, we may practice in our lives. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Thank you.